Thank you. Uh, so I'm, my name is Ari Talia. I'm working in Rovio Entertainment and uh, we've been building the cloud platform for our games for the last two years. So I joined Rovio in, the, in uh, February two years ago. Um, what we needed to do was to provide some kind of uh, tools for, the, for our games uh, to synchronize the data and do things uh, between devices and have uh, better connectivity uh, in all kinds of ways. Like have a virtual currency system and uh, then some uh, generic services like leaderboards and stuff like that. Um, what we did, uh, uh, we started to build these uh, services on top of Amazon platform. And uh, the development started uh, about two years ago, a little more than two years ago. And uh, we knew that it's going to be really big when we launch it. So we needed to prepare, we needed to prepare for the worst. And that was a thought in our design uh, from the very first steps. So that we're not doing any single point of failures or we can scale up to any numbers. So we started with um, uh, one data center in US and uh, we're testing on second data center in Europe right now, but uh, we're not, we haven't taken that into production yet. And uh, one of the reasons has been that there hasn't been the real use case for taking uh, the second data center into use. And we also have plans to establish one in Asia as well, if needed. Uh, I think the biggest reason for those is to have uh, better service quality for the players, since we can uh, establish the services really close to the end users. However, there are some other uh, reasons for running it on more than one data center. For example, on hurricane hitting US East Coast, we could lose Amazon for a couple of days and it would be really nice to be able to move everybody playing on the second data center in Europe. Um, what, how, how do you build services on top of uh, cloud environment? Well, one of the key things is that um, the platform is really unreliable and don't take it as a bad thing, really. If you're building something on top of your own boxes at the office and you think that those computers are going to stay forever, it's not going to happen. They just fail, trust me. They always fail. And uh, what, what you face in uh, cloud environments is totally random because you don't see the machines. You only see the virtual box that is running on a physical machine somewhere and someone else is controlling it. And the guys in Amazon can take it away because it's not functioning properly anymore. Uh, you may get a notice that this machine is going to die soon, or you may not. You can lose network for one device, or you can lose uh, disks or whatever. It can fail in any ways. What you can do is to have some kind of metrics uh, on the stability and the life, the kind of status of your device or the, uh, the box that you're running uh, so that you know if it's failing or if it's running properly. And once it's not running properly, discard it, create a new one. That's really easy. That's how the uh, cloud environments work. You can have any number of instances and you can spawn new instances really easily as long as you've done things properly. Um, one of the key things is that you really design to fail. You can lose anything from the system. And to achieve that, you, you don't have any single point of failures in the system. Um, one really important factor in making such an environment is that you automate everything. You don't want to have a guy sitting on, in front of a console uh, being prepared for a catastrophic thing to happen and then uh, run some deployment scripts manually. What you want to do is to trigger those automatically, run them, try to make things as robust and uh, self-maintaining as possible. Uh, what we wanted to do from the day one is that um, 
we wanted to automate all the steps. Like a, when a software developer makes a commit to version control, we want to make sure that that version is also a functioning version. We want to make sure that it's running properly and to spot any defects in the code as soon as possible. So one way is, uh, to do that is to automate all the steps to the level that uh, every commit triggers uh, the build to all the way to Amazon into a test environment. And uh, that way we can know that this is the build that broke the system. We know that this, this was the change that is making things wrong. And obviously, in this kind of environment, you're not deploying to production immediately. Uh, that would be crazy. So what you do, you have a testing and staging environments to make sure that everything is running smoothly. And you have some kind of uh, gatekeepers there to pro prevent people from deploying accidentally to production if a build is not functioning properly. So as long as you have some automated tests, it's quite easy to block those failing builds. Um, and one key thing in order to make this uh, uh, useful is to have, um, have all those environments built in a such way that they are almost similar to each other. So you're not running totally different test setup or totally different staging setup from the production. You should, they should reflect the, uh, each other so that uh, any uh, software you're testing on them is also working on production almost certainly. Um, what we did uh, in our development is we tried to make things really easy. We tried to have, uh, well, I, I'm saying that you're not supposed to create a single point of failure, but in this case, it's having a single entry to the system is quite, quite practical. So you, uh, for the security reasons, you have a single pipeline into the system, you have a single entry point, uh, usually a REST API or something like that, and that's the way you control your environment uh, normally. Obviously, so in some cases, you need to have a deeper access to the hosts, and then that could be arranged for some set of people who know what they're doing. And uh, how we did it, well, uh, Amazon, as a cloud provider, uh, gives us quite handy um, programmatic APIs for different languages. So, for example, in Java, it's relatively easy to control uh, the system via those APIs. And in addition to that, some configuration management tools like uh, Puppet or Chef or something like that, uh, they make life a bit easier. The a uh, key thing is that uh, you can create everything really easily and it doesn't require any manual work. And in the end, we built a clean and simple API to the system. And we call it an orchestration system because it's orchestrating everything. It's um, providing a REST API for everything, like uh, deploying new versions, uh, scaling up services, uh, managing the instances, like uh, killing one of them, or uh, creating totally new services, stuff like that. And uh, one of, last but not least, the monitoring. Uh, we really need to know what's running there. And the tools Amazon provides give you some visibility to the instances, but they don't really tell anything about the software you're running on them. And in addition to that, uh, <laughs> there are lots of things that can go terribly wrong in those environments. So having your own metrics and own monitoring is quite a nice thing. Obviously, you can use uh, third party or open source software to help that, but you need to be able to provide those metrics. Um, we selected Maven as a build tool because uh, Stack was very Java-based and uh, it's been quite handy. It's, um, we can make all these things via one plugin and it's uh, it's really easy to build things all the way to the production or um, test environments. And, and then, uh, obviously, we wanted to have uh, each environment in an isolated, in, uh, isolated system. So uh, Amazon provides um, virtual private cloud that makes things really handy. Uh, there are similar concepts on other cloud vendors, so it's quite easy to uh, build uh, things because uh, you don't 
need to worry about the, uh, messing with other environments that much because they are not visible. So um, as I said, um, we use Maven to build things. Uh, they send the data, uh, the packages, files, everything via uh, the REST API. And uh, then we have some operational tools to monitor and do things like that uh, using the same REST API from the server. We build different pipelines for different services so that they are not uh, interfered by other jobs, like if uh, something is running on some service, it's not uh, allowed to do anything else at the same time. And uh, then obviously uh, different services can be uh, deployed and configured and scaled uh, simultaneously. Uh, the, everything is, the business logic is put into one engine, so we don't have anything that is uh, Amazon specific in that engine, but we built a, an abstraction over uh, Amazon and uh, OpenStack as an example. So we could deploy the whole thing on top of the other cloud pro providers as well. Um, this is an example of our environment, one service in our environment. It's um, it's an example of um, how we can use automation. So this um, graph over there is showing the number of API calls to the system on some days. It's showing three days of history in March. And in addition to that, there was some batch processes running on the first day. And uh, the system is, um, Scaling, scaling up and down the service automatically. So no one is really touching that. Uh, the, the number of instances on top right is um, automatically handled by uh, the monitoring and automation tools. So we don't need to do that stuff during the nighttime manually. And uh, why would we want to do this? Well, to save some money. It's uh, it, relatively expensive to run big services on Amazon. And if you want to, if the service is really uh, stateless and it's easy to scale, why not to scale it uh, according to the peaks in the traffic, not to run uh, the full capacity all the time. And in the end, we got pretty, uh, well, I wouldn't say smooth CPU load, but uh, it's not reflecting those uh, changes in the traffic anymore and not taking into account the uh, batch processes that were running on one day. So it's, um, it's evening out the load quite nicely and we can prepare for uh, even worse peaks if something happens, if we get some load uh, for whatever reason. Um, so in the end, yes, uh, it will fail, designed to fail. It just will happen, trust me. And build and deploy continuously. It's, it's a very good thing. You can, you can see, uh, you can spot all the problems in your code as soon as possible if you're uh, making them run on a production-like environment uh, after every, every commit. And try to automate everything. Um, if you're doing something once, uh, do it, do an automation for it, because you're probably going to do it twice, or three times, or four times in the end. And soon you notice that, hey, um, I'm using more time repeating this manual task uh, instead of automating it in the first place. <clears throat> 